It had been three years since the Latter-day Saints began to settle in Jackson County, Missouri, the place that the Lord revealed would be Zion. There were now more saints in Missouri than Ohio, and they made up a third of the county. The saints were from the north, and Missouri became a slave state ten years earlier with the Missouri Compromise. Tensions simmered as W.W. W. Phelps and a Protestant minister, Benton Pixley, traded jabs, labeling each other false prophets. In the same issue of the church newspaper, W.W. W. Phelps printed an article entitled Free People of Color. The article quoted the Missouri Code regarding proselytizing amongst enslaved people and formerly enslaved people, free people of color, whose movements were curbed in Missouri. Though the article began to prevent any misunderstanding, misunderstanding was all that came from the article. In the 1830s, the church was considered too liberal and too welcoming to too many different peoples. The Missourians claimed the saints were tampering with their slaves and inviting free blacks from other states to come to Missouri. Phelps attempted to write an extra correction, but it could not extinguish extinguish the spark. The article lit a fire under the Missourians, which exploded in the town square of Independence. Missouri citizens demanded the church stop its printing operation and close the bishop's storehouse. Church members refused, and things escalated as the townspeople destroyed the church's printing press and ransacked Phelps' home. Bishop Edward Partridge and new convert Charles Allen were then tarred and feathered in the town square when they would not deny the Book of Mormon. Two weeks later, Joseph Smith received the revelation in Section 98. My name is Janice Johnson. I'm a Willis Center Research Associate at the Maxwell Institute, and I, along with Joseph Stewart, the Public Communications Specialist, We'll be discussing each week's block of reading from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Come Follow Me curriculum. We aren't here to present a lesson, but rather to hit on a few key themes from the scripture block that we believe will help fulfill the Maxwell Institute's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and to engage the world of religious ideas. There is a lot going on here a whole lot. For instance, it's very interesting to me as an American Latter-day Saint living today to understand that the church was perceived as being too liberal and too welcoming to too many people, when sometimes, fairly or unfairly, Latter-day Saints are seen as being too insular, that we keep too much to ourselves, that we're too conservative, and that we keep people out. It's incredible to think, as historians, about change over time, but also to think about how What is seen as liberal in one situation is seen as too conservative in other situations. And certainly the situation of the saints has changed. In the early church, there were significant points of tension with how the church acted in respect to women, in respect to Native Americans, to Indians, and also to people of color, to Blacks, to former enslaved people, to free Blacks. And this all comes to a head in Missouri. And when Joseph receives this revelation, there's a lot going on in Kirtland. And he doesn't. He has heard the beginnings of what's happened with the saints in Missouri, but he does not know the full extent. And I think that these first three verses of section 98 are really poignant. Joey, do you want to read part of that? Absolutely. It reads, Verily I say unto you, my friends, fear not. Let your hearts be comforted. Yea, rejoice evermore, and in everything give thanks. Waiting patiently on the Lord, for your prayers have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath, and are recorded with this seal and testament. The Lord hath sworn and decreed that they shall be granted. Therefore, he giveth this promise unto you with an immutable covenant that they shall all be fulfilled, and all things wherewith you have been afflicted shall work together for your good, and to my name's glory, saith the Lord. This idea that affliction can work together for our good, I see these three verses as a balm to those saints who are in significant distress, perhaps to a balm as a balm to to us when we're in significant distress. But this idea that affliction can come together for our good, that it can be transformed into something different, 
is really a remarkable thing to think about. Not just the redemptive power of the atonement, but the transformative power of the atonement. That affliction can be turned, no matter the source. And here, the Lord's very clear that the saints are at fault. This did not just happen when the saints were doing what they were supposed to be doing. But the Lord is clear that the saints brought some of this upon themselves. Yet, it can still be transformed into something good. Now, no Latter-day Saint, or any person for that matter, should go out looking for affliction. I don't think anyone would, but it still feels like an important (laughs) thing to say. We apply balm often when we have been burned, or when something has happened to us that we have dried out spiritually. And I love that you use the word balm because I think about being able to replenish ourselves with the living water, with Jesus Christ. The next three verses speak to the Constitution of the United States. It reads, Verily I say unto you concerning the laws of the land, it is my will that my people should observe to do all things whatsoever I command them. And that law of the land, which is constitutional, supporting that principle of freedom in maintaining rights and privileges, belongs to all mankind and is justifiable before me. Therefore, I, the Lord, justify you and your brethren of my church in befriending that law, which is the constitutional law of the land. I love that, befriending the law. (laughs) The language there is kind of fantastic. How do we befriend a law? What do you think? Well, I think it is understanding the law and using it to one's advantage is how I read this section. It's maybe somewhat ironic that the Latter-day Saints are involved in the first major freedom of religion case that goes to the United States Supreme Court in 1878 in a case entitled Reynolds v. United States, which talks about whether or not it was constitutional for Latter-day Saints to practice polygamy under the idea that it was protected by the freedom of religion cause. Now, this is something that you can read more about in Sally Gordon's classic study, The Mormon Problem. Sally is not a Latter-day Saint, but is as sympathetic and cuts through the malarkey, you might say, about (laughs) everything surrounding the case. But there are real questions in here that the saints have, including, aren't we protected by the Constitution to be able to live our religion the way that we choose to? It seems important to me that those who are tarred and feathered in Missouri that you mentioned at the beginning are asked to renounce the Book of Mormon before their attack. And I can understand a Latter-day Saint living in Missouri saying, hey, I am protected by the Constitution of the United States. Why can't I live my religion? Why can't I profess my religion? And this is something that we'll see going forward, that the saints expect legal protection for their beliefs, and they don't find it. And for more on this, I would actually recommend Spencer McBride's new book entitled Joseph Smith for President, where he explores how these events in Missouri shaped Joseph Smith's quest for the United States presidency in order to ensure rights for all minorities, including religious minorities. Very good. And and this tension between vigilantism on one hand and perhaps an unconstitutional law is going to, we're going to see this throughout this period of Latter-day Saint history. And I think that there are a lot of really practical pieces of advice that the Lord is giving the saints at this point. How are they supposed to deal when they're attacked? And the Lord is pretty consistent. Renounce war, proclaim peace. Beginning in verse, about verse 23 to 31, we have what Steve Harper has called a Latter-day Saint law of just war. Now, just war is a philosophy, uh, mainly a Christian philosophy, which has been expounded and developed over centuries. But when is war okay? Especially for a Christian, right? The idea that understanding Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, when is it permitted to defend yourself? If we believe that individuals are children of God, is it okay to kill people? These are heavy questions. And I think that this response that we get from the Lord, it reveals a lot here. The phrase that we get most frequently is, bear it patiently. 
Now, the Lord says in verse 24, but if you bear it not patiently, it shall be accounted unto you as being meted out as a just measure unto you. So first thing, we have to be patient. If we fly off the handle at every infraction against us, there's going to be a problem. The Lord's going to say, sorry, it's a just measure. And then that that message is repeated. Bear it patiently. Your reward shall be a hundredfold. And so we get three times the Lord says, bear it patiently. Offering the person who is offending you, the person who is afflicting you, a time to repent. And then we get to verse 29. And then if he shall come upon you, I again, after the third and fourth time that you have bore it patiently, I have delivered thine enemy into thine hands. Now, I think that this verse 29 opens the door a little for people to respond back and fight back. And there were times that the Latter-day Saints swung that door wide open and rushed through it to fight back. But if we continue it, that if thou wilt spare him, thou shalt be rewarded for thy righteousness and also thy children and thy children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Um, in verse 32, the Lord says, this is an ancient law. This is the law I gave unto my servant Nephi and thy fathers, Joseph and Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, all my ancient prophets and apostles. I'm really intrigued by why Nephi is mentioned here. It's really perplexing to me. As we read Nephi's own account, as he writes, he is justified in all the things he does. But I don't know. I'm really intrigued why the Lord mentions Nephi here. It's a really interesting point. I wonder if this is something, I know that I encounter this when I introduce friends and family to the Book of Mormon. Kill an intoxicated man is a really interesting way to open a book of scripture. And I wonder if this is something that Joseph Smith is thinking about, even as he's in the midst of all of these other situations, if as he continues to publish new editions of the Book of Mormon that have small alterations to them, I wonder if this is something in the back of his mind. How does Nephi killing Laban fit into the idea of justifying violence? And the Lord's message continues to be lift a standard of peace. I, the Lord, will fight your battles. When we get a few revelations later in section 105, the Lord will say to the saints, sue for peace, not only those who have smitten you, but to all people. This is a very difficult switch for faithful saints to love peace, to sue for peace to do whatever we can to let the Lord fight our battles rather than us fight our own battles. This is difficult for the saints in Jackson County, and this is difficult for us today. Yeah, one of my favorite sermons is President Kimball's address, The False Gods We Worship, where he says that we are a warlike people, meaning Latter-day Saints. So more than a century later, this is still something that we are fighting as a people. The idea that we have a right to stand up for ourselves and that we should be able to act aggressively. He also tells us to not kill the little birdies in that talk, I believe. It also reminds me of something that the Lord will say in section 121, where he instructs Joseph Smith and those who are following this counsel to act in the way that God would. That sometimes you must reprove betimes with sharpness only when moved upon by the Holy Ghost. And then afterwards show an increase of love toward him whom thou hast reproved, lest he esteem thee to be thine enemy. It is always about peacemaking. I will also add a plug here that the Maxwell Institute has a book coming out near Thanksgiving by Patrick Mason and David Pulsifer about our Latter-day Saint ethic of peacekeeping and peace building. So keep an eye out for that. I'm really excited to see that book. Section 99 shifts us to back to a missionary section and revelation that's given to a specific individual. Here, it's given to John Murdoch. John Murdoch was born in Delaware. He had 
been a member of a, a variety of different churches in his lifetime, Lutheran Dutch, then Presbyterian, then Reformed Baptist, then Campbellite. But in the fall of 1830, Julia and John Murdoch met Oliver Cowdery as they lived in Northern Ohio. He gave them a Book of Mormon. John read the book and said, the spirit rested on me, witnessing to me of the truth. He read to Julia and was filled with the spirit as he read. Julia died not long thereafter as she gave birth to twins. The Murdochs had three older children. John and Julia were the twins. Joseph and Emma would adopt those twins in April of 1831. Here, John Murdoch is given a task, a mission from the Lord. Specifically, in this moment, he is called to go to the eastern countries. But the last verse says, Thou shalt continue proclaiming the gospel until thou be taken. John Murdoch will fulfill mission after mission after mission during his lifetime. He'll go on the mission to the eastern states. He'll go to Zion's camp. He is the first missionary to Australia. This will continue throughout his lifetime. There's something else in the text, too, that when I was a Latter-day Saint missionary, I was maybe overexcited about. There may be actually an inverse relationship between what missionaries think is cool and what is actually valuable for the people they're trying to reach. But the idea of dusting off your feet says that the Lord will fight your battles in the section. He does not say you will win all of your battles. In section 99, verse 4, it says, And whoso rejecteth you shall be rejected of my father and his house, and you shall cleanse your feet in the secret places by the way for a testimony against them. And again, this was something that I felt very, uh, actually, I don't recall ever doing this, but thinking, oh, well, they rejected me. They will get what is coming to them. And looking back now, that's something I'm ashamed of. I don't think that we need to get a little too excited about a testimony standing against somebody else. As Dan Belknap, a faculty member in religious education here at BYU, has written, there are similarities in both meaning and form between the ancient and modern ritual practice of wiping the dust off one's feet. But the average Latter-day Saint today does not understand the ancient context as is practiced in the New Testament. And certainly, and the average Latter-day Saint today has no need to leave a witness against those who reject them. We believe in a merciful God who will give us chance and chance again to hear the gospel. We need to act like we actually believe that message. And I think that the church has done studies and most converts have had an average of something like 12.